This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Hi everyone, I know we're all hurting right now. Crypto has taken a beating and Goldman Sachs says flatlining is the best case for stock heavy portfolios. Flatlining? Zero returns? Sheesh. In situations like these, we can take a cue from the world's best investors because a groundbreaking Ernst & Young study last year revealed that 8 in 10 ultra-high net worth individuals invest in alternatives. However, Bank of America's CIO recommends investing in one specific high-performing alternative to rescue your cash. He's talking about fine art. Two-thirds of millionaires already hedge against inflation with art, according to UBS, because the last time inflation was this high, art appreciated by an unprecedented 33.2% annually. Now, obviously, uh, most folks don't exactly have tens of millions lying around to start buying Banksy's and Basquiat's, but that's where Masterworks comes in. They're helping people keep their cash intact by offering fractional investments in the top 1% of the art world. And with a recession on the horizon, they've seen signups increase by 320%. That combined with the fact that they speak to every investor to make sure art is right for them. That means there's a wait list, but I'm hooking you guys up with priority access to skip the line. And it's as easy as going to masterworks.com and using promo code crypto conversation. That's masterworks.com promo code crypto conversation and you can see important regulation a disclosures at masterworks.com slash cd again that's masterworks.com and use the promo code crypto conversation to skip the line and now folks it is on with the show <laughs> My guest today is Chris Kastig. Chris is the co-founder of Console, uh, which is very interesting. It looks like they're building a kind of a, a Web3 a Discord uh, with some DAO tooling. And uh, Chris is also general manager at Trust Machines, and they're working on uh, Multisafe, uh, which is obviously a... Uh, uh, yeah, self-custodial uh, crypto solution, I think. And uh, it says in front of me, Chris, that you're a, a professor at Columbia University Business School. So plenty to talk about. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So happy to be here. So let's do what we do at the beginning then, Chris. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get you to please introduce yourself. I'd love to hear a little bit about your, uh, your personal story, uh, what you've been up to, your life story, all that good stuff kind of leading up into uh, the Web3 space. Yeah, so if, if the question is, how did I get uh, to Web3, then for me, it was Napster. I don't know if you if you remember Napster, uh, Andy. I do remember Napster and particularly uh, LimeWire. I was a big fan of LimeWire back in the day. And look, you may have seen LimeWire kind of reinventing themselves at the moment as like a, a music NFT platform or they have aspirations of of doing so so yeah i mean a, a lot of a lot of cool internet stories uh, begin with napster though right chris yeah that's i mean that's amazing yeah i remember limewire and BitTorrent. like basically the the reason like i, I was a music major at the time and, and then i was like in, in a band you know throughout most of that through like their you know, early to mid aughts and um and to me it was just really exciting because all of a sudden with napster um, it really just opened my mind to what decentralization was. People called it peer-to-peer -peer, and peer-to-peer -peer is essentially, you know, I can share a file with just any person directly. And that was amazing because before that, um, everything was really centralized. You know, content creation was very centralized. If I wanted to buy an album or as a musician myself, if I wanted to share music, you needed a record deal. You needed access into um, a record store. Like, you know, this is like in the nineties, right? And in the early aughts and stuff. And so, you know, all of a sudden like BitTorrent comes around, you can just exchange with person to person. Um, and that was the, to me the earliest, you know, vision of what web three could be. I mean, nobody was calling it that back then, but it really inspired me. And so I, I was a developer at the time. Um, I had taught myself how to code a bit as I was playing music. And then I went and studied uh, decentralized networks at University of Amsterdam because I want to just understand what decentralization was. And then uh, long story short, 
you know, at, at some point learn about Bitcoin and the possibilities of, you know, using the blockchain for all this. And yeah, just couldn't help but get just like over my head <laughs> excited. <laughs> nice. I love it, Chris. And look, I'm just, you know, looking through uh, your website and you j just have um, some some brief notes about yourself. And as I said, so co-founder of Console, uh, you seem you're, you're writing a book or you're partway through or maybe you've finished it. It's called The Decentralized Generation, Seven Lessons for Dis Staying Digitally Literate in a Web3 Era. That's coming next year, I think. Again, like I mentioned, a uh, professor at Columbia University Business school you're a, a alumni of y combinator and i believe you're a podcaster as well man you um are you doing all this at the moment chris or is this sort of spread out you're a busy guy um no yeah not uh i not the podcast thing and y combinator was about like eight years ago but uh, for my last company yeah sure got it all right well um I suppose, and I can see there's some great stuff that you've um, some written over the years, various uh, various essays. I had a quick look at some of those yesterday that have probably uh, informed uh, your thinking and, and helped you build uh, your own personal thesis for uh, what you want to do at console and, and how we can help the decentralized generation. So do you want to explain a, a little bit about what console is and um yeah, what, what, what it aspires to be and perhaps weave in the origin story, Chris. Console is Web3 chat. So right now chat exists primarily on Discord for a lot of crypto communities. And the problem with Discord is it's very centralized. Um, it uses uh, email and password for identity in a central database. And anytime it tries to use Web3, um, identity or things in the blockchain, it, it uses bots in order to interact with them. So the big thing with this centralized entity or platform also trying to, you know, have these decentralized web three principles is um, there's a lot of back and forth through all these points. And this is where a majority of the hacking and, and, and um, security vulnerabilities end up coming through. You'll see that people get fished. You'll see that bots get compromised. And so what we set out to do with console is not only build uh, a better UI that feels like it's for the Web3 community, as opposed to gamers, because if you remember, Discord was made for gamers and still is majority for the gaming community. So we built, you know, we built console for Web3, uh, which to us means aiming for decentralization. You own your own identity, you can export your data, and it's all gonna need to be open source. So we're, we're working towards open sourcing it. So really just living the values of the, you know, the Web3 communities, all the communities, um, DAOs and everybody that's building on Web3, it doesn't make sense to build on Discord. So we're building, we've built the new home and that's what we're testing right now. We're, we're in beta right now with a few communities. Yeah, well, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Chris can certainly see that there's an, a need for uh, something like this. You know, Discord has been, I suppose, the uh, the easy solution to date simply because, you know, it's it's there and it works and it was designed for things like gaming communities. So very easy for, uh, for Web3, NFT communities, DAOs and so on uh, to... Uh, essentially take on Discord as, as their natural home, which they have done. But you're right, and these problems that you've identified, uh, it just it makes the user experience hopeless because the, the de facto advice to anyone new coming into uh, Web3 or NFTs is like when you go into Discord, turn off your um turn off your direct messages by default because if you leave them on you're just going to get an endless stream of uh, potential scams fishes and just absolute garbage coming through and it can be wow. very it's discouraging for for you know people who've been around a bit but it would be bewildering uh for new people so uh, but it's it's a shame because Sometimes it'd be nice to be able to uh, direct message each other on <laughs> Discord, right, Chris? <laughs> yeah, that's um, you know, that's the promise. And the cool thing is, in you know, different ecosystems, there's already identity. Like, really, whether it's chat or social media, whatever it is, it starts with identity. 
And we already have great identity systems. There's, for example, the ENS um, naming service, right, on Ethereum. So if you have a .eth name, right, um, this is a similar thing building on Bitcoin with a .etc name. There's a .sol name. Um, all of these are what's called decentralized identities. And they're kind of like the way I describe it to my my class, who is all business you know, students, uh, not very technical. The way I describe it is, you know, people understand domains, right? People understand, um, you know, whether it's like Instagram.com or TikTok.com or whatever, they understand that there's these domains um, and there's only one domain. And actually domains provide a really amazing service of security that we probably don't think about too much. But anytime, you know, you go to a website, if you go to Instagram.com, for example, when you go there, you look in the URL and you're like, oh, this is Instagram.com, right? It's not Instagram with like four M's, for example. Um, of course, that's how phishing attacks happen. But, you know, we look at the at the bar sometimes we're like, oh, is this OK? I'm on the right site. I'm at Google. Right. And we use the domain because we know there's only one in order to verify that we are basically talking to who we think we're talking to. And it really works really well. It's, it's protected the web for, you know, for a long time. And now um, decentralized identities are taking domains and then basically, whereas in web two, every website has a domain, has an identity, has like a node. Now every person has their own node. And so it just ex exponentially increases the amount of identity, but also allows us to own our identity um, in a way that even if Instagram goes down, if Airbnb goes down, you know, let's say I write a million reviews on Airbnb and get reputation after all those years. If Airbnb goes down, I lose that. But the power of decentralized identity is now I own my identity or my domain, whatever you want to think of it as, and I can keep that data with me. I think that's the big promise of these. And we're just at the beginning of this. Yeah, really nicely said, uh, Chris. And uh, so uh, from what I understand, I think you mentioned it yourself, uh, console is in beta testing at the moment. And funnily enough, uh, Chris, I uh, was having a chat with um, uh, a very good uh, friend of mine yesterday. In fact, um, I was recording a podcast with him, so it's probably... Uh, the podcast previous to this one, depending on what order I publish all these shows. But his name, I think you'll know uh, who he is, Chris. Oh man, the suspense must be killing you. But his name is Brett, uh, Brett Herscope. Uh, so Brett from from Gamma, uh, a good Aussie, Aussie Aussie mate of mine. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that I was recording with you, and I said to Brett, "Do you know Do you know this guy Chris from Console? Because he seems to be dabbling a little bit with um, various bits and pieces on the Stacks ecosystem. And man, my buddy Brett is all about Stacks, and of course, you know Gamma and and look NFTs on Stacks. Uh, so Brett, of course, said yes, Andy. I do know Chris. Chris is a fantastic guy. I've been um, on a lot of calls with Chris. I've been a beta tester of Console, and um, I. I would recommend him as a guest for the crypto conversation. Do you want me to do an intro? And I said, well, no need, Brett. I've got, I'm talking to Chris tomorrow. It's already booked. So um, yeah, but Brett was saying lovely things, not just about you, Chris, but certainly about uh, his experiences so far with console. So I guess this is a roundabout way of saying shout out to Brett and um, how how is the beta program going? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, Brett has been, um, yeah, very helpful for um yeah helping bring console to life and i think like the takeaway for the audience there is you know as part of building this over the past year we started last september um you know we've been just working with real communities and brett was one of those communities that i think he joined us in december he's been like doing wow. beta testing with us and right? like clicking yeah. prototypes and giving feedback and we've just been iteratively working with dozens of communities and so he's been one of the earliest supporters so um so yeah very thankful to all our early supporters like brett and um yeah and we are we are rolling out with one of his communities right now and um they're they're using it and it's been uh it's been really exciting i mean i think you know i guess a lot of the lessons from web 2 like in starting a startup like they still apply in web 3 you still need users you still need to test it you still need a good product and um yeah i think that's been our process and so grateful to the people that helped us user test the whole time 
Yeah, well, so if that's and I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean that's great. I'm so uh, intrigued to hear that. I didn't know Brett had been, uh, yeah, kind of testing with you for that long. And if it has been that long, I'm sure he's, uh, you know, obviously um, in in a lot of communities and knows how to run Web three communities. So um, yeah, I'm sure that's we've been, been a, we've been in stealth mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, we have been like zip mouth stealth mode for a while, so it's possible he just didn't didn't mention it. <laughs> no doubt. So how how far um, off is launch then? I suppose that's kind of the next uh, logical question, yeah, right, yeah. Chris? Yeah, um, we've launched in a beta, so people are using it in small communities right now, and this just gives us an opportunity to like slowly scale. You know, bring in maybe like you know, a dozen or a few dozen people every week um, over the next few weeks as we slowly ramp up. And it, it gives us a chance to just continuously test, you know, every single button, every single experience and just get just get feedback. So that that's where we're at now. Um, you know, we have a team of 14, so it's a big operation that we're running. And um, yeah, a lot of exciting updates coming out. I guess, you know, if anybody's listening and you're like, maybe how do I get early access or how do I get my community on to join? Um, we do have a wait list and you can go to console.xyz and just submit there either as an individual or there's an application for a community. So if you're wondering like, how do you get a sneak peek? Um, we will be rolling it out um, cohort by cohort over the next few between now and the next three months. So, and then hopefully opening to everybody. So that's awesome. Well, I'm starting to get curious uh, myself, Chris. So uh, maybe um, for the benefit of the listeners and, and of course, uh, myself, can you talk us through, you know, you, you did a, a great job of kind of describing uh, the need for something like this that runs on uh, like a, a decentralized identity. Uh, but, you know, talk us through just anything uh, that you think would be interested in in terms of what the actual user experience inside console looks like what is similar to discord or what is what is different to, to discord what are people using using it for what what can you do and and what are the kind of behaviors that, that you've been observing so far great yeah i mean if i had to kind of flash a few things that might get people excited then i'll try to do that because i can talk for a long time about the security which is true you know we've put a lot of a lot of work into security we have a security team uh cyber security team um you know, and, and we've rebuilt, you know, we're working with digital identity. So you own your own identity. Like, I think these are honestly underappreciated um, components of the infrastructure, which is going to make it feel a lot more focused and a lot more like, like a little more like Slack, like you'll be part of your community rather than whereas in Discord, you kind of feel like you're getting hit from all angles and it's like very overwhelming. So um, so it'll be like a really focused uh, experience, kind of like Slack, if you if you like that experience, but decentralized. But I think a few of the kind of like features that like I think people are getting excited about. So um, one would be we have a feature called Inbox and Inbox allows you to see all of your notifications across all the communities you're in, in one place. And you can choose how granular you want those. So if you want it to be just at replies or just DMs or just like alerts from certain people, you really can like tune that. And then when you you know log on the console, you just have to kind of look in one place and you can just answer all your messages in your inbox. So that's going to be a big time saver because right now, anytime somebody at replies me in Discord, I have to go search through it and I have a lot of blinking lights on my left and this is going to be really helpful. I'll give you two more. Um, the second feature, which I actually haven't really talked too much about, um, but when is when is this podcast airing? <laughs> but I'll, um, maybe I'll share it. Well, well it's airing uh, probably this week, uh, Chris. Uh, oh, oh. Well, either Friday, let's say either Friday or early, early next week. But look, if you if you got some alpha to drop, some some exclusive news, I would just invite you to continue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll share it. Um, it, you know, it might not be for a little bit, but um, but we have a feature that we're gonna roll out. Um, not it's not live yet, but we're testing it, and it's called multi sig messages. And this is really cool because if you understand how multi sig wallets work, basically you have multiple owners in order to send assets. Um, we have the same thing for links. And so if you wanted to do a minting link, right, you could essentially have like two or three people sign off. The admins could all sign off and it won't go live and push until 
everyone is signed off. And then when it does, I'll have a special kind of like signature. They'll show everyone has signed it. So that right there is going to really reduce the amount of like potential for fraud and just really bring a lot of authenticity, I think, to any Bintic links. You could feel sure that like three, like at least three people have seen it. So that's what we're really excited about. Yeah, I, I like I like the sound of that. So yeah, because that would uh, obviously, you know, anyone in any Discord NFT communities will be aware that uh, that is one of the uh, tactics that scammers use, isn't it? They'll they'll just spin up a, a fake uh, mint site for like a popular NFT collection, and then they'll try and spam anyone anywhere really, Twitter or, or Discord. And so yeah, some I think it's yeah so. Tools like that, uh, Chris, are part of the solution. I guess the other part of the solution is this, just the ongoing need for constant education to new people coming in. Because even if there are tools uh, such as what you're building, um, human nature being human nature, people can still just get suckered in if they if they uh, see something shiny and new on Twitter. And sometimes uh, if you're, yeah, people just get caught out, don't they? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we, we want to be the safe platform for sharing that link with your community and for really just for communities in general, so that you can feel like when you're with people in your console, you know who they are. You can really easily see, you know, when they purchased their .eth name or their NFT. Um, you can see, did they buy it yesterday? Did they buy it two years ago? Um, and, the, you know, I'll give one more feature. We have a lot of exciting things, I think, but one more feature is like, we're also doing uh, integrations with um, other open source um, kind of like uh, services out there. So for example, like we'll do an integration with Snapshot. So if, if you're in your community and you and I are chatting, right? Well, I could be able to see like, okay, Andy's sending me a link. Um, who is this person? Maybe I don't know it, but I could click and see like, oh, well, actually Andy's been really involved like on Snapshot or in different parts of the community, whether it's like past history with the NFTs or chatting or collaboration, like we're trying to build that up to build some kind of like a reputation. So you get a glance kind of know, you know, is this a person I can trust? And it doesn't take all this friction to be like, who is this? Should I chat with them? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, really well, well. I, I love the sound of that as well. So uh, fantastic, Chris. I, th I think this sounds great. So, you know, again, for people who are intrigued, want to get on the, the wait list or um, try and get your community involved, uh, the website is console.xyz. Um, and maybe just as we finish off this part of the podcast chris you know you're um you're a university professor you're an author you've written a few um i don't know think piece style pieces kind of um you know the the common thread i guess is um perhaps a kind of history of of technology and how uh these strands are, are coming together to create what uh we're potentially calling web 3 and perhaps in the future the metaverse <laughs> but uh one of the threads of course is this idea of on-chain reputation um so maybe chris just to, to finish off this part of the podcast you know what whatever you want to share in terms of your thoughts on on some of your writings or how you see um, you know, uh, things like uh, the, the future decentralized internet and on-chain reputation. Uh, what all this means for perhaps the, the, the future of uh, modern societies? Yeah, that's a, definitely a really big question. It and, is. Um, yeah. <laughs> open-ended. It's an open-ended question, Chris. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that, I think that maybe some frameworks to kind of help the audience, you know, to rethink some of what whatever we think Web3 is. But in some ways, I feel like Web3 isn't the third version of the web as much as it is the second version of the open source movement or the second revolution of that. Nice. And what I mean by that, yeah, is that in a lot of ways, what we're calling decentralized, working in public and um, sharing code, um, you know, all this transparency, like, this is something that's been happening for decades and that's been the open source movement, um, which has its roots. It goes all the way back to MIT in like the fifties where people shared one computer and just didn't put passwords on because there was only one computer. 
uh, has roots in the 1984 when Richard Stallman started giving away his code for free and people thought he was wildly crazy. And then in the late 90s with the open source movement, with uh, mostly with Linux, with the operating free operating system. And then from there, like GitHub and everything took off. And a funny fact, fun fact too, um, uh, I don't know if anybody knows this, but like, do you know who the person who invented Git is? Maybe Maybe people know that, but I don't think so. Do you know? I think, no, I don't. So the guy who invented Git is the same person who invented Linux. It's Linus Torvald. So essentially okay. he built the first like big, massive scale open source project. And when we say open source, all it means is a bunch of strangers working for free. On our, it's, like a, a, it's like an early DAO basically. And then like GitHub, which is now like the repository for all this source code, um, you know, is basically built on something that he was trying to solve one of his own problems. Kind of shifting that back to where we are now with Web3 and thinking forward, you know, if we think about it like that, then really the big innovation is that with Web3, we can work in public and we can have DAOs or we could have money that no one person owns, but everybody owns. And we can monetize it. We can have incentives. We can do transactions, all the stuff that people love, creator, shared ownership, all of this stuff is now possible. But it really supercharges the movement which already existed of like sharing, openness, all that kind of stuff. So when I see the future, I see it just continuing to open up and continuing to decentralize. And I would say if you follow the open source movement, um, you're likely to kind of, you know, if you think about it through that lens, I think you're likely to see the way that governments become more transparent and open. I mean, money is the first step into a government being transparent. Um, and it just goes, you know, from there where it's like records, where it's voting becomes more um, trusted on the blockchain, you know, where we keep removing people and we have code, um, you know, a smart contract, right? A smart contract can't keep a secret. And that's the coolest thing about it. And so we can trust it because we can read the code. And I think we're going to see more of that of just, you know, wherever there's opportunities for um, centralized people, centralized companies, I think it's going to open up. And I, I think it's going to make, hopefully, make the world less susceptible to corruption and hopefully more apt for coordination and working together. Well, that's at least the dream, you know? It is the dream, and that would be, uh, wow, what a wonderful world that would be. Less corruption. Uh, I don't know how realistic it is, but that is, uh, that's why we want to try and put some of these decisions, uh, take them away from the nasty humans fallible old humans anyway yeah. it was like a nice a nice place to go to uh break uh chris and then we will come back and we'll have some fun we'll run you through the very famous crypto conversation hot take round back in one second here's what's being said about masterworks my name is jacob in i'm from long island and i've invested over seventy three thousand dollars with masterworks my portfolio performance just wasn't cutting it i researched all these alternative investments like crypto and nfts but they didn't make sense to me then I read about Masterworks in Forbes, and I signed up right away. And now you can too. Thanks, Masterworks. Get VIP access at masterworks.io and use promo code Jacob. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash DC. And we are back, and I'm with Chris Kastig. Chris is the co-founder of Console, a very cool-sounding new kind of communications platform. It's a bit like Discord, but it's for Web3, and it runs on decentralized identities. It's in beta, but um, slowly moving towards general release. And, of course, uh, you can uh, sign up to the early waitlist at console.xyz. Chris, I like to feed, uh, Chris, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes are you up for it let's do it just going to run some questions at you chris just want you to give me your uh, your honest quick snappy answers kind of hot take style question one chris is and we haven't really talked about this so i'll be interested to dive into it just a bit uh where would you say that you sit on the bitcoin maximalist uh, to multi-chain opportunist uh spectrum I am multi-chain in that I believe in Web3 in general, although um, I would say that I think there's a really big opportunity for Bitcoin with layers like Stacks, so very excited about that. Yeah, I thought you'd mention Stacks, and so just again, what's the um, what's the hot take summary of, I guess, the, the promise and potential of Stacks and, and how uh, you, you're reasonably deep in, in the Stacks ecosystem? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I've developed some projects there as well. I mean, the hot take is, you know, with Ethereum, you can write smart contracts. Um, with Bitcoin natively, Satoshi didn't make smart contracts. So Stacks allows you to have smart contracts. It allows you to interact with code, um, do DeFi with native Bitcoin, do NFTs that are secured by Bitcoin. It really just opens up what Bitcoin can do. And um, it's still fairly new, only about a year and a half old. Um, and I think that's reasonable too, because, you know, it's hard to do decentralization first, which Bitcoin did and then to later you know figure out how to tap into that um and so i think it's been a hard challenge but uh, you know the team is some of the most impressive phds and smartest like computer science bitcoin people i've ever met in my life so very excited about to see where they take that no doubt i mean shout out to the stacks dads and uh yeah people like maneeb i had maneeb on the podcast a couple of years ago i think just as he was might have been just at the end of the kind of the, the block stack era but yeah man very smart team indeed all right let's keep it moving uh chris what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion my firmest conviction about like the future or what well just know what what's a crypto opinion that you hold that you have pretty strong conviction <laughs> uh not your keys not your identity I like it. That's a great one. All right, Chris, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So again, big open-ended question. Uh, whatever you like here, you know, Web3, a DeFi on Bitcoin, a blockchain in general, what does it all look like in 10 years time? Yeah, I, I would hope that within a year or two, I think the big challenge is inclusivity. We need more voices in Web3. Um, we need to bring it to real projects um, like government, like NGOs, like companies, you know, and we're starting to see it. But I imagine years two to 10, I think that's going to be it's going to be about bringing it to the mainstream because we're still building a lot of the infrastructure. But another two years, I think we'll get there and then it'll just be bringing apps it'll be all about apps and people won't even care what's on the other side of it they'll just want more um i don't know the pro most people just want whatever is cool <laughs> but i think the cool kids will want what's secure and where you know better designed and and uh web3 so that's exactly right chris they want whatever is cool and whatever is seamless and it's like yeah. easy to use um, which uh, the other side of this is a, is a quote by uh, sci-fi author William Gibson who of course said that the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed with that in mind Chris can you think of an example of the future being here right now uh, but most people just aren't really aware of it that's my favorite quote. Um, to me, that I used to say that about 2013 when I had discovered Bitcoin for the first time in Silicon Valley. So that used to be my moment. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the future is. I, to, to me, I think, I, I don't know. I, I eat a plant-based diet and I'm vegetarian. I think the future will be more plant-based. So that's my... Yep. Well, wow. I, I like that. That's, a, that's a, a, a very valid perspective as well. All right. Well, I guess um, time to zoom out, time to get a little bit weird uh, for one second, Chris. We've got a little bit weird, but let's get weirder. What do you see as the long term future for the human race? Do you see dystopia or utopia? Um. Oh, okay, definitely not utopia. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're engineered for utopia. You know, there's a lot of people that have everything in the world, right? And they're miserable. So, um, yeah. But I, you know, I think, you know, I guess I look the next few generations. I'm really inspired by Stuart Brand and the long now and long term thinking. Um, people that are doing that long term thinking. Um, yeah. And to me, I guess maybe, I don't know about the human race, but. So like the next hundred years, like there's going to be a moment. It's like a like we are a system. We are a big system, and there's going to be a moment where we burn our hands, so to speak. I want to say where um, you know COVID is like a moment like that, where we all kind of had the whole system kind of like you know was shocked. I think unfortunately there's going to be more of those moments, and and it's because of overpopulation, and which is related to climate change. Um, but with that said, I think historically. We learn, there's a great book by Matt Ridley called The Optimists Something, The Optimist Something, um, about looking at history. Um, 
And it always it seemed like, you know, polio or whatever disease or whatever war, World War II, that it was going to take down everything. And it did for a bit, but systems are resilient and humans are resilient. So I guess all I can say is, you know, I think that there's going to be probably in our next generation's lifetime of kids and um, some pretty hard times as there always is. But I think if you look at um, Steven Pinker's work, Yuval Noah Harari, you know, if you look at over hundreds of years, we get stronger, there's less wars, there's less famine, there's less disease. So I think we're going to get better overall, but it's going to be a bumpy next few decades. Yeah, very nicely said, Chris. Uh, I think I would tend to agree with that. And uh, with that, we, we come to the end of the show, really. The, the final question, of course, is, uh, Chris, what is your favourite science fiction uh, book, film, uh, TV show or universe? Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess like the original like thing that comes to mind is just like The Matrix. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like... <laughs> obvious as that sounds but you know there was just something about i don't know like the, the first one only the first one anything after that's ridiculous but um but yeah just the first one just like and the philosophy it was based on and all that stuff it was just really well for for like um i was pretty young when i saw it and it just like really opened my mind i think to Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, well, funnily enough, a couple of times people have asked, they've flipped that question around with me, and my go-to answer, uh, Chris, is exactly that, the first uh, yeah. Matrix film, because, first and it's still, you know, so irrelevant to everything from, you know, simulation theory uh, to, um, yeah, it, AI, yeah. bad AI, AI, evil AI, yeah. Terminators, all, all that stuff, but done in just a, a really interesting way. And of course, all the yeah philosophy uh, references made it super interesting. Yeah, hundred percent. I rewatched it recently, and it I thought it stood up the test of time. <laughs> in my nice. Opinion. All right, let's close this out, Chris. Um, uh, take it away, please. Just tell the people where they can go to find you on Twitter or wherever else you like to hang out online. And of course, what they should do if they want to uh, uh, join the waitlist for console. Yeah, if you want to join the waitlist, you can come to console.xyz. For communities, we have an application. For individuals, you could just share your email. Um, all the updates will be on our Twitter. It's console DAO. It's on Twitter. Um, and I am on Twitter as well. I'm at Castig, C-A-S-C-I-G. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, if, you know, would love to hear what you guys are thinking. So please be in touch. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. All the best and bye for now. Thank you. All right, there you go. That was Chris from Console. Said it a couple of times during the show. I think Console, it sounds like a pretty interesting platform, definitely a need for that in uh, the Web3 community space. I mean, I know there's a few different teams working on uh, similar uh, products and solutions. So, hey, the more the merrier, I reckon. Uh, thank you for listening, team. Don't forget to subscribe to the Crypto Conversation in whatever podcast app you're using. Give us a rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Uh, but hey, for now... It is goodbye. That was today's show. Thank you. This was the Crypto Conversation for a brief. <laughs>